and identification of media. Victoria Gray from the Turtle Island News. Good evening, Victoria. Good evening. And I see no other media on the line. So I will move us into um, the adoption of the agenda. But just before we do that, I just want to acknowledge we are live on Facebook. Uh, we just went live. So I want to welcome the community uh, to the General Council meeting of May 10th and note the start time of 10 11. With that, uh, I'd like to turn uh, a council's attention over to the agenda. And we're looking for um, the adoption of the agenda. Any changes and deletions? Uh, Wendy? Hi, I, I did send a request out. I don't know how everyone feels about putting number two in camera in the open session. I didn't see, um, I guess I don't know why it is in camera. If there's a reason for that, then let me know. But otherwise, um, can it be open? Yep, so I, I work with Tammy to see and, and do some uh, reach out um, to the Dev Corp. Um, and I don't know, Tammy, if you have an update or Brooke. Yes, so I did confirm with Matt and uh, he had, did reach out to their proponents and they have no, no issues with having it discussed during the open session. Okay. Okay, so if council's okay uh, with a request and the proponents have no problems, I have no problems. So we will move that into the delegation presentation part. And maybe for timing purposes, Tammy, we can just let them know that there's three presentations prior to them, half an hour each. Uh, and uh, maybe we can expect them uh, between, maybe, let's have them ready at seven. Uh, for a 7.30 um, estimated time refrain for that presentation. Okay, got a thumbs up. I also got a request, um, uh, understand the still a little bit of work that might need to be done in terms of agenda item number seven, the council appointment to ODG. Um, is there any reason uh, why we can't defer this and put it in, in camera? Uh, understand folks would uh, have a little bit more comfort level speaking to that. Not today in camera, but at a future in camera. I don't know, Darren, if, if you have any comments on that? Yeah, I think it was just a request that we that we defer it. Uh, this, it's no urgency per se, but uh, yeah, that's exactly it, Nathan. If we could if we could just move it or just defer it to a, to a next meeting in camera, that would be perfect. Okay. Uh, any objections from council on that? Hearing none, okay. Is there any other agenda items? Seeing none, can I get a mover? I'll move, Sherry Lynn. Move by Sherry Lynn, seconder. Second by Wendy. Okay, it's been properly moved and seconded. We do have an agenda item moving from in, in camera into the open session as it relates to um, the Dev Corp, and um, that's the only change. Um, so if there's no further comments, I'm gonna go to the vote, all in favor. Is there any opposed? Seeing and hearing none, motion has passed. Moving us into the delegation presentations, I see we have um, Marshall Serville, uh, apologies if I pronounced that wrong, uh, from Trent University. And she's here um, looking for approval and acceptance of a presentation uh, requesting permission to use community's name in a publication written in her PhD thesis, Risk and Development of Water Management Strategies. So with that, uh, Marcia, um, you have the floor. I would suggest maybe um, 10 to 15 minute presentation uh, opportunity for questions. Uh, and that'll give us time to get back on the agenda. Uh, but before I turn it over to you, I do see there's a question. So uh, I'll turn it over to Wendy. Thanks, Nathan. So before um, we hear the presentation, is there background from the ethics committee on process to get here? Because if this is a completed study, if it's already gone through ethics, if this was already approved, 
then do we have that information? I'm sorry if I missed it, but I did look through the documents and I didn't see that. So can we get that explanation before the presentation? Or is yeah. this in sort of after the fact? Um, I'll need Michelle's help on this, but my understanding is this has already gone through the process. The research has already been completed. Um, I don't know if the, the presentation of the, the findings has been uh, provided to the community, um, and, um, but this is kind of the end uh, result of, of that particular um, research. And my understanding is, is now they're looking for the publication aspect of things. Uh, and I'll have to turn over to Marsha. Marsha, I don't know if, if there was a presentation to the community on the findings of this particular research. Um, hi, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, just letting you know that this research was done in two parts. One part was already started a trend before and I followed up with it. That's the more testing and sampling part. And the second part to interview experts and in terms of water professionals and health professionals, it went through ethics, it got an ethics approval your so which present, so which, um, fine, I guess, which study are you looking to utilize the name? I'm touching both. I'm touching a little of both, like touching both parts of the study. So I'm just, because they're linked. Okay. Yes. Um, but am I, like, I, I guess, am I wrong? Like one of the sections is completed? Both are completed. And I have sent reports to the community. Um, I sent it to public works. Okay. We have copies of that and some, yes. Okay, so there might be a missing component at our end. I don't think council has seen what those final reports uh, detailed, um, which, which makes this difficult to approve as, as you can imagine. And I sent um, a copy of, I think both, to remember to the ethics committee as well. All right, okay. I'm having difficulty hearing. Yeah. I don't know if it's just me. I've sent a copy. The ethics committee has the, um, the report as well. So the Six Nations Ethics Committee? Yes. yes. So is, I guess, Nathan, my question is, so we also have the research, water research through Guelph. Is this part and parcel? Is this different? Does this accompany that? So, because it looks very, very similar and, you know, permission to use our name, our name isn't even referenced properly in the document. So I, sorry, just, I don't know what I'm approving. Sorry. Yeah. And I'm open to corrections and that is why we shared it as well. I'm open to corrections. I'm open to, you know, whatever way I could improve it. I, I'm, I'm gonna suggest, um, Marsha, that um, we connect back in with ethics because I think that's where, and, and our, our apologies, because this has kind of been a standard on, on the ethics piece is, is kind of that, process piece and we're struggling with bringing the information forward. Um, I, I don't feel comfortable um, without council having seen the results of the report um, to, to be able to um, go forward with this particular project. And I'm gonna suggest maybe a go back to ethics and, and we go through the, the, the procedure on that, but I don't know. So We've been doing this for a while, going back and forth with ethics. And I'm on ethics, which is... Okay. So do I contact Teresa again? Uh, okay. Wendy? So, so I, I'm confused because this is a recommendation from the ethics committee that it be approved. So, <laughs> so I, I guess... So what ethics? If you're on, if you're on ethics, but, but then there's also, when you look at the report itself, I mean, it's thanks to, we have a number of our staff people. So are they here to speak to it 
as, as well, if we're a partner to this. That, that's where I get confused because if we're a partner to it, then why are those individual staff not speaking to it mm -hmm. as well in support of this? And, and, and the direction from ethics wasn't for this particular motion. It was for a presentation to council on the findings. And I think that's the step we're missing. So she's completed two studies. And what we actually asked for was, and I have it in my notes here, I have to go back, was for the actual presentation on the findings to come to council. That way, in this format, we can present that to the entire community. So there's that awareness. And definitely, as, as Wendelin's kind of pointing out, all of those partners would be part of that presentation. So Marcia, maybe what I'm gonna to suggest to you is, is um, my apologies for, for the, the miscommunication and the missteps, uh, but uh, touch base with Teresa and uh, we'll get this back in proper sequencing. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you very much. Again, yeah. Okay, Council. Um, so yeah, and and just a just a note um, for for um, the purposes of of this discussion is we're we're going to have to look back at the ethics process and and really get a handle on that. I know Michelle and I have been trying. Uh, attending those meetings, but I think this is an internal piece where we have to get our, our uh, pieces in order. So is it okay if I leave now? That's what I'm trying to Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and what we'll do is we'll touch base with Teresa. I'll, I'll actually step in and, and make sure it's sequenced properly so that the, the next time you come to um, uh, the, this uh, particular meeting, you'll actually be presenting the findings of the, the, the research that you have completed. Uh, we have, would have already read the report and, and we can have that conversation at that time. So um, thank you for your time today and, and uh, we'll be in touch uh, for a future engagement. Okay, thank you. Thank you. No problem. Okay, Council, I'm gonna move us into our next uh, agenda item. Uh, we have uh, Sarah Smith with us, our epidemiologist in terms of health services, uh, to provide us with an update on the community health uh, assessment. So Sarah, floor is yours. We're doing about 10, 15 minute presentation. That gives us time for questions and then your motion. So Sarah, take it away. Okay, so just going to share my screen. So just double checking that everything's showing on your end the way it should be. Just a thumbs up if it is. Looks good, Sarah. All right, thank you. Um, so Thank you for inviting me today to present on the community health assessment. This is a project that I've been working on. Um, so I'm just gonna provide an update today. So I'll be providing an overview of what a community health assessment is and some uh, results that have been coming back around health outcomes within Six Nations. And in addition, some planning that has been going around on on a community health survey to help fill in some of our data gaps and understanding. And lastly, some next steps. So what is a community health assessment? Uh, a community health assessment is a systematic collection of the health status indicators for a given population. So what does that mean? So it is essentially a snapshot of the health and wellness of the community at a given time point. So a community health assessment can assist with planning, prioritizing, and measuring impact and progress over time. And what we want to ensure is that we are taking the same picture each time we do this assessment. So this allows us to measure change over time and see how well we're progressing towards our goals. So it's important that we are measuring the same thing so that we're measuring apples to apples, not measuring apples one year and oranges the next. So that means 
uh, the questions that we ask. We want to make sure that we ask in the same way, provide the same responses so that five years from now, we could do the exact same assessment and we can show trends and how we're progressing, how things are changing over time. So where did the need for a community health assessment come from? Like I uh, briefly spoke to previously, we do have some data gaps in accessing health data. So due to the complexities of uh, being a First Nations community, we have data in provincial databases, we have data in federal databases. And these databases don't talk to each other. And there are also a lot of barriers with accessing our own health data. So over the years, we have had um, challenges with understanding what are the health outcomes in the community that are most prevalent or most common. Um, so uh, in off reserve or in other municip in municipalities, um, Brantford, for example, they can just uh, look in these provincial databases and say, we want to know how many people in Brantford have diabetes. And they are able to access that information. Whereas um, Six Nations, because we share multiple postal codes, we can't just pull all of the data from our postal code because we have multiple. In addition, we know people, our, our members that live off reserve may be at, may be accessing and do access services on reserve. So it's important that we are able to try to capture our on reserve and off reserve population as well. Uh, number two is that uh, there has been previous assessments done over the years and a previous review has found that the things being measured were not comparable. So, uh, each assessment was measuring something different. So one year measured apples, the next year measured oranges. So they asked different questions. They were trying to look at different things. And in, in the end, the data was not comparable or comprehensive. So we have some questions that we need answered and they are what diseases and conditions impact the community. And we know that it's not just uh, health outcomes that are important, but it's important to understand what factors might be leading to these health outcomes. Um, and also what behaviors influence the health of our population. So all of these uh, health behaviors and determinants of health, they're called, all impact the health outcomes that we see in the community. And it's important that we have data on all of those different aspects to provide a complete picture of where we are at as a community in terms of our health and wellness. And this information provides us with key priority issues in the community. So here's an overview of <clears throat> the health assessment. So it includes um, multiple components. So if you think of we can't get all of our information from one data source, source. So it's like we're putting together a puzzle. If we're trying to create that picture of health and wellness of the community, we need multiple puzzle pieces to begin to piece that together. So what I'm going to be pre presenting the results on today are some of the health outcomes for our adult population. And this was done in partnership with ICES, which I will get into in a few more slides. And component number two, which will provide us with more information around determinants of health and health behaviors and how those impact health outcomes. Um, so that's another component of this health assessment. Now there are some research priorities that are kind of taking deep dives into community issues. So for example, uh, water quality, water access and connection to water um, that's a, a priority issue within the community, and the Oneganos Research Project is helping to fill some of those data gaps of how um, access to water or water security impacts not just physical health, but also mental and emotional health. Another um, study that's kind of working to help inform this overall community health assessment is the COVID community study. So what that's looking at is 
the immune response to the vaccine, but also natural immunity over time and how chronic conditions can impact that immune response as well as infectious, uh, as well as um, an infection to COVID-19. And lastly, how the pandemic has impacted the community mentally and emotionally. And one last component is just looking at the future direction of where we're going as a community and our community health system. So what I'm focusing on and what my projects are primarily um, priority for me is the health outcomes and the community health survey. But I just wanted to provide that overview. So Six Nations Health Outcomes for our adult population, this provides, like I said, one piece of the puzzle. So through a, what's called a data governance agreement with ICES and Chiefs of Ontario, uh, they were able to link data from the Indian registry with uh, provincial health administrative data. And that allows First Nations communities to conduct uh, health analyses on um, topics within their community. So working with ICES, we wanted to gather um, some common health outcomes, some health outcomes that are important to Six Nations that, are that um, might be uh, seen in Six Nations uh, more frequently. Uh, so some inclusion criteria. So uh, that an individual is on the Indian registry and has an Ontario address because it is accessing provincial health administrative databases, that they have a valid health card so that you're able to find them in the database. Um, exclusions, anyone under 18 or over 106. Um, if they are missing a postal code, or residence code, then you're unable to do that data linkage. So you can't be certain that it's the same person. So then that person is not included in the cohort. So, so a cohort was established by ICES by linking this data. And a cohort is just uh, a subgroup of the, the, the overall population. So it does not include every Six Nations member in the community. So there are limitations to this method. Um, so if you have a different address from the Indian registry and uh, your OHIP card, for example, the data is not able to be linked together. If you do not have a health card or have not updated their health card, they're not included in analysis. And finally, the, da the data ha is from 2009 to 2018. So there's a little bit of a data lag uh, due to it going, it has to pass through the provincial system um, and ensure data quality and um, privacy and security processes are all followed before it's transferred into ICES data, data sets. So there, it's not, it's not live data. It's not up until 2022. It does take some time of processing. So this is just a chart for how the cohort starts and how people are excluded out of the cohort. As you can see, it started with 20,596 that were able to be linked together and through those exclusion criteria, it ends up with a final cohort of 11,706. We, we know that we're missing people within this data, within this cohort but this is the largest cohort that we have been able to establish to look at our health outcomes. Um, the last time there was a comprehensive look at health outcomes in Six Nations um, on a kind of needs assessment basis was in 1994 um, that I'm aware of, and that had a sample size of less than 2000. So since then there hasn't been that comprehensive look at health outcomes. So this is, while there is limitations, it does provide us with some good information. So this is our overview of Six Nations health outcomes, and they're broken in uh, four broad categories, chronic conditions, infectious diseases, injuries, and mental health. And these are all of the health outcomes that have been requested. <clears throat> so just to start off with chronic conditions, chronic conditions 
are broadly defined as conditions that last one year or more and require ongoing medical attention or limit activities of daily living or both. So we do have a high prevalence of chronic conditions and multimorbidities. Um, but if we compare this to the general Canadian population, uh, the Canadian Community Health Survey found, found that 33% of Canadians had two or more chronic conditions. If you look at the percentages above, you'll see that 54% of the individuals in that cohort had at least two or more chronic conditions. So we have a much higher prevalence of multimorbidities. So meaning that there's more than one chronic condition at one time. And the reason this is important to know is that it does create complexities to patient populations that we serve. So when a service provider is trying to meet the needs of a patient or a client, uh, they have to consider, they may be having to consider multiple chronic conditions and how those may be interacting uh, with one another and also any types of medications that may be interacting and side effects that occur because of that. So it's, it's important when we're looking at um, equitable resource allocation. If we have a complex patient population, it's important that resources are assigned to Six Nations that kind of reflect the, the specific needs of the community. And this section is looking at prevalence and incidence of chronic, of some top five chronic conditions. So prevalence is basically a snapshot in time. So what we have um, in the first area is uh, prevalence of these chronic conditions from 2018. So you can see arthritis, hypertension, diabetes, coronary artery disease, which is the most common, uh, the most common form of heart disease. And it's, uh, it's where there's narrowing or blockage in the coronary arteries the arteries uh, from the heart, and COPD in 35 plus. So incidents, so that's the number of new cases that are occurring in 2018. Number one is hypertension. Number two is cancer. And you see that it's not in the prevalence um, top five. And number three is diabetes. Number four is arthritis. And number five is renal disease. So sometimes you might see a decrease in prevalence when, um, when a condition is severe. So you may be seeing um, more death occurring in that condition. So the prevalence looks lower, um, but the number of new cases coming in is actually high. So with renal disease, uh, when I look at the prevalence, it's the ninth most common chronic condition. Um, renal disease is most commonly caused by diabetes and high blood pressure. Um, so looking at the data, we actually saw a spike in the number of new cases for renal disease in 2017. So this is definitely an area that uh, we should be looking more closely into. Um, top five common cancer types for 2018. Number one is skin, number two, female reproductive system, number three is breast cancer, number four is digestive system, and number five is respiratory systems. So the most common cancers across 2009 to 2018 is skin cancer, female re reproductive system, and breast cancer. This next section is infectious disease. And it is the most common reason for healthcare visits. So healthcare visits are physician visits, hospitalization, emergency department visits. And infectious disease as a whole, uh, of looking at all of the different types of infectious diseases is on an increasing trend in the community for this cohort. Um, one thing to note is water, food, and enteric diseases which is diseases that are caused by microorganisms such as viruses, bacteria, and parasites are more, most frequent, and they're most frequently the result from consuming contaminated food or water. Um, this in Six Nations within this cohort, it's much higher than surrounding areas. And 
Also to note, chronic conditions can increase the risk of severe illness. So if we have a high prevalence of chronic conditions, this also puts our population at risk for severe outcomes of infectious diseases. And there is also um, increased evidence that infectious diseases are connected with chronic conditions. So as an example, the human papilloma virus um, causes several types of cervical and oral cancers. So that's where it's important to also have information on uh, health behaviors, such as uh, attending pre-screening, um, having vaccines and things like that. Um, mental health. So some highlights from the mental health outcomes is that suicide rates in 65 plus are higher in comparison to those under 65. In addition, the rates for 65 plus have been increasing since 2012. So the reason I'm um, highlighting this is because often we talk about uh, youth and suicide rates, but older adults are also at risk for suicide. Um, especially when we look at uh, having multimorbidities or um, loss of dependence, isolation, um, those kinds of things increase uh, suicide risks in older adults. And we can see that that's actually on the rise when we look at the other demographics. So our 45 to 54 and our 55 to 64, you see that line is relatively stable with, with some dips. Um, and then even the younger de demographic you won't see here. And that is because the, uh, the numbers were so small that the data was suppressed for uh, confidentiality reasons. So when there's uh, less than five cases, the data is suppressed. Overdoses um, are increasing and local surveillance also identifies high rates of suspected overdoses. Concurrent disorder, so that's having a mental health disorder and a substance use uh, issue at the same time, that's increasing in 18 to 25 age group, and it has a higher incidence of concurrent disorder than any other age group. Mood and anxiety disorders, so those are things such as depression and generalized anxiety disorder uh, have the highest incidence, so the highest number of new cases per year. And lastly, injuries. So neuro neurotrauma is on an increasing trend since 2009. That is the orange line. And that is injuries to the head or spine. Um, since 2011, transport related injuries have been increasing. Incidence of falls is in 65 plus is high. So it's at 1,403 per 100,000. And when we, uh, when we start to look at um, risk factors for falls. Often when someone is on multiple medications, sometimes that can increase your risk of falls. Open wounds is the most common cause of hospitalization or emergency department visits. And kind of connecting this back with chronic conditions, this can reduce immune function. Chronic conditions can reduce immune function resulting in slow to heal wounds. So this is just a table outlining the top 10 health outcomes from 2018. Um, but I just wanna highlight water, food and enteric disease. So we are at 2,536 2, per 100,000. If we compare to Hamilton, which has the same measure, um, they have 45 cases per 100,000. So we're much higher than um, Hamilton. Um, if we look at our top four most common health outcomes, you see that they're infectious diseases and we have open wounds as an injury. Um, so just highlighting, um, typically what you would think we would see was, would be uh, chronic conditions at the top, but what we're actually seeing is infectious diseases and injuries. So what can be done with this data? Uh, it can be used to advocate for funding new and expanding programs and services, identifying priorities to address, and inform areas we require more information. Like I said, this is just a snapshot. There may be some areas where we, we need to kind of dig a little bit deeper. 
and it can create awareness to a health outcome and identify strategies for prevention. So when we're looking at preventing health outcomes, it's important to not just look at what, what are the health outcomes, but why are we experiencing these health outcomes? So that's where the determinants of health, which are the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes that people live within. So those are things like education, access to healthcare, your housing conditions, your environment, all of those things impact your health outcomes, but also your health behaviors. And your health behaviors, things like eating healthy, um, exercising, any um, risk factors such as substance use, um, all of those things impact health outcomes. And we can't just get that information from uh, ICES or looking at health outcomes. We have to gather that from community. So that's where the community health survey really will help us fill in some much needed data gaps. So the objectives of the community health survey are to get baseline data. So this hasn't been done before. So this, this will be our first um, data point from a representative sample, meaning um, it's, uh, it's not the entire community, but it's enough of a sample size that we can accurately say that it reflects the larger group. Um, create a tool for monitoring health and well-being in the community. So we want to be able to measure progress. We want to see how we're meeting goals and um, any, any identify any emerging issues. And we want to identify health and wellness priorities to better meet the needs of the community. So this is the current sections in the survey. I'm not gonna read them all, but it does um, look at access to healthcare, determinants of health, um, those kinds of health behaviors and different, uh, different aspects of health. So not just physical health, but mental wellness, emotional health, um, those types of things. So there are a few phases of the survey. So right now we are in the planning phase. That's where we're identifying resources that are required, establishing the methods, so how we're going to do the survey and developing the survey tool. As we move through the phases, planning will be ongoing. Um, but the next phase that hoping to uh, begin is end of May to end of June is actually pre-testing the tool. During this pre-test phase, uh, I will start to uh, look to increase awareness and promote the community health assessment as well as share results of the health outcomes. And that's Pre-testing is where we start to fine tune the survey and obtain feedback from community and service providers. So uh, making sure that the questions that are being asked are uh, understood, that there isn't confusion around the responses or, so it's just to identify any problems with the survey um, and get feedback from people who have not been involved in developing it. And from there, you would revise accordingly. The next phase is actually piloting the survey. So that's where we test the method. So it's like a dress rehearsal for the actual survey launch. And we would continue to do awareness and promotion from our findings from actually piloting the survey that we would revise the methods and revise the tool accordingly. So this is where we ensure that we're getting um, good data quality. Um, that timeline is from July to December 2022, so that's where uh, we pilot the survey, we uh, review the data, make sure that it's good data quality, um, and revise anything that's needed. And the final phase is the actual launch, so recruiting for the survey, and the timeline for that is uh, to be determined because we're going to learn a lot during that pilot phase but hoping to launch in 2023. That's just a graphic of the survey timeline. So next steps for me is to disseminate this information more widely uh, around these health outcomes. So I'll be developing infographics on these broad categories, uh, developing an online dashboard for easier access to the data so that um, 
it's accessible to not just service providers, but also community. And providing a full report about the health outcomes from 2009 to 2018. And, um, also doing a request for child and youth specific health outcomes. So we have the adult health outcomes, and now I'm looking to uh, completing a request for child and youth. And third, complete the survey draft and pretest of the community health survey and start to work through those phases. So that's everything for me today. I know I provided a lot of information, but thank you for your time. If there are any questions or comments uh, from community or anyone else, you can email me at epidemiologist at sixnations.ca. You can also call or text at 519-732-7943. Thank you. So that's it for me. Thank you, Sarah. Um, really insightful con conversation that you introduced here, and and actually feel we we um, we as council should support you a little bit better in terms of uh, innovative ways to get this kind of information out to the community, um, uh, because that was quite lengthy, and, and I don't think we're giving um, that the topic, the serious topic that you're introducing, the the time it needs with uh, the delegation portion. So. Um, we'll, we'll think of ways uh, and definitely uh, support you a lot, a lot better um, going into these presentations so that you get that community feedback. That's so important. Um, so with that, there's uh, a few hands going up and, and we do have some time remaining. So I'm going to go to uh, the order that I have, which is Audrey, uh, Wendy and Michelle. Hi, Sarah, that, that was uh, well presented. And I fully support your initiative, what you're doing for us, and it's wonderful. I have a question, and that question is, uh, do, are you keeping track of the immune responses from COVID, and I guess across Canada and uh, the province, and will it lead to a yearly vaccination, or will it be a, a couple of vaccinations per year? And I would like to uh, make a motion that I accept this uh, uh, presentation that that uh, Sarah's done, and what's uh, does she have a recommendation? Okay, and I uh, move her recommendation that the human services members of the six nations of the Grand River Elected Council to accept and approve the community health assessment update. I so move. Nathan, can we have a discussion before we move to a motion? I was just going to suggest. Um... Uh, uh, we've noted to yourself, uh, Audrey, as, a, as wishing to move, but um, still a lot of discussion to go uh, in terms of going forward on this. So Sarah, I'll just turn it over to you for that quick response. Um, so in terms of tracking the immune response, uh, in the COVID community study, it is looking at uh, the natural immune response over time uh, to vaccination immunity, but also natural immunity. Um, so that's uh, people who are participating in that study, that information will be uh, aggregated, so combined together, and uh, we'll be able to see how that changes uh, over time. And in terms of if we'll need a yearly vaccination, unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball, but we are continuing to uh, get updated and stay updated on research that is occurring in Canada and uh, any new guidance that is coming out. Thanks for that, Sarah. I'll go to Wendy. Thanks, Sarah. So, I mean, absolutely data is critical to moving forward, to doing any type of strategy, to doing planning, you need to work from, from data. Um, so information of what we know and, and you know, scanning that information. With what you've been able to gather, I was trying to figure out what your cohort number was that you used from, from the chart. I wasn't able to figure that out. Uh, I think it was on your inclusion exclusion process. But, um, you know, the concern is, and it, it affects us across the board, is it's always old data. So even looking at this 2009 to 2018, we've got a three-year gap. And in this particular three-year gap, it's COVID. So the impact of COVID is dramatic on every population, let alone in First Nations communities. So when you look at the information you were able to, 
to gather. Um, and I don't know if it's full data or some of it is anecdotal from what you were able to extrapolate and then make assumptions from that. But on mental health, on just on every indicator, there's an impact from COVID. You know, even respiratory, those long-term effects, all of that information. So I don't know how we pick up that gap within this process. But in looking at the recommendation, my question is the way that it's written that we accept and approve the assessment update, does that mean that it's an automatic approval and veto of the survey draft and the pretest of community health survey that you're going to create? Because the first thing that we'll get from community is what is the survey? What's it asking? What's it for? All of those things. So I'm a bit uncomfortable giving that approval without knowing what that survey is and what that looks like and what's going out to community. So I think it's almost a two-step, certainly accepting it as information and what you've got so far, but then a next recommendation, once you've got a draft coming back and presenting that draft piece as well, so that we can move to the next, the next steps. So that's kind of where my head is at with, within this process. Um, I don't know how you feel about that, but um, just some comments that I have, thanks. Thanks, Wendy. And, and I think that's what I was getting at too, because in, in terms of where this has come from, like moving it over here without that process and sequencing thing um, kind of um, puts, again, puts a disservice to the actual topic too. So um, Sarah, I don't know if you had further okay. comments. Sorry, just before that, just a, a subsequent. And, and I agree with what you're saying. I think this is a full meeting in and of itself because this is a huge topic area. And I think it would have been fantastic if Sarah could present and have community input, have people be able to ask questions and understand and have that dialogue, I think would be helpful to Sarah in the process as well. So just, you know, I, I think we're kind of falling short here. Thanks. Uh yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think it would be great if um, I could get the opportunity to kind of uh, hear more feedback from community. I completely agree on that point. And in terms of, um, I guess in terms of process, I was thinking the community health survey would go through the ethics process um, just because I, I find it very valuable to um, to go through the ethics process to make sure it really makes you as a, Kind of a researcher to make sure that you're looking at all of the different impacts that this could potentially have on on community and on in individuals so that's kind of where i was thinking the actual approval process of the survey would go is through that ethics process but um i'm open to any suggestions that this group has for sure thanks sarah and I, and I think your assumptions are right at this point and and like i said earlier you know council's got some work to do to, to one support you better and and look at ways to smooth line and streamline that ethics process uh michelle okay um thanks sarah i apologize um and so i i would agree with wendy evidence is key so the fact that you are um, gathering the data is ideal my I guess I want clarification because I know you want to compare apples to apples. You are including COVID into your research questions. That'll be over, you know, your longitudinal study there. So I, I guess I'm just cautioning because I think your questions will be different from five years from now. Correct? And so how would you compare those? Because... I'm assuming you're talking about the pandemic right now, which I think that's a study all onto itself and the impacts it's had. Um, and five years from now, we'll be um, generating different questions. So just, you know, cautioning on that. But <clears throat> um, what was my other question? <laughs> I completely forgot my other question. But yeah, I would second accepting the information. So. Oh, that was it. Did you go to ethics for this? 
to collect all this data because I'm, I'm really thinking, you know, sitting at ethics, we have not heard, we've been asked for a lot, a lot of people have come to research us in health, predominantly health. Have you looked at what their research says? Have you compiled that lit review to see what, um, or will that be included in your five-year study? So I did do a, a document review of our previous health assessments and also tried to gather as many kind of research projects that um, are similar to doing these types of assessments and looked at what were they measuring and how what were their methods because I wanted to uh, really get a good understanding of the methods that these health assessments have done um, and looking at their sample size as well um, the types of measures that they looked at um, in terms of the COVID-19 uh, specific questions um, when we're looking at a health assessment what we're looking at is some key indicators that we want to track over time. So one of them might be uh, the percent of community members that are food insecure, for example. And so there might be, a, there's a scale uh, where we can measure food security and it would be at this time point. So right now, uh, just as an example, and then five years from now, what does that uh, food security scale look like on average in the community? So it's not, specific questions to COVID-19, that's kind of where that COVID community study helps provide information on COVID specific questions. Um, that's why I included that into that overall community health assessment because there's research priorities that are kind of digging deep into these issues that are community issues. Whereas the community health assessment, we want to try to make it, uh, these are the indicators that we want to capture. A lot of them I looked at, um, you know, in the community plan, there was these measuring progress goals. So what, what did these measuring progress goals look like? And what could be an indicator that could measure that? What questions could we ask to get at that information? So uh, just saying that the COVID-19 specific questions, I, those are in the COVID community study itself. Okay, so you're utilizing the various resources to do your assessment. You're putting that puzzle together, as you said. Okay, thanks, Sarah, and thanks, Michelle. Uh, Wendy. Yeah, I mean, I, I could talk about this all, all day. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is a prime example, and this is such a huge case to look at because Everybody does research on us. Michelle is absolutely right, all around us. So doing a lit review, I mean, there's tons of information. Everybody's doing studies on us. There's all sorts of literature on us that we have not had any participation in. So it's based on assumptions and data bought by others. Here we have someone internal that can do this work. So we should have a control. This is OCAP, right? This is that ownership, control, access, and possession of our own. So we should be leading this. And if anybody wants to be a part of it, they have to do it on our terms, supporting Sarah in the work that she's doing. So CIHR being able to get that grant and get that and being a direct conduit of that so that we control what's going on around us. That way we could funnel everything in and control that. I mean, that's a political agenda that we should be working on, but it's also changing the mindset of how we do business around it, because this is such a huge driver, especially if we're looking at long-term health planning and, and what's going on. So, I mean, like I said, I could go on all day about this. So it's such a huge issue though. Um, and I think we need to reroute it somehow. I mean, the, the previous presentation, right, about water and, and using our name, yet, you know, we don't have anyone speaking to it from the community. It's all from the outside in. This in it is an opportunity to do it in, inside. And I think we need to support that process and how can we um, do more in, in that role. So, I mean, I'll stop there. And I know that we have Haudenosaunee Health Services next. So, I mean, there's a, there's a marrying there of how can we 
work together and how do, can we get best efforts within that process? So um, not putting Colleen on the spot, but you know, that's, that's something to look at too. Thanks, Wendy, and 100% and agree with, with that approach. And I think that's that was my concern with um, um, the presentation. I didn't have any concerns with the presentation, just are we giving this enough attention? And um, I, I think what we'll do, Sarah, is definitely look at um, uh, providing you with some opportunities in, in the very near future to get in front of the community on this. And, and then, yeah, as Wendy said, this is a, a practical example of getting OCAP um, in place within our community and, and kind of having ethics kind of take control of that particular piece. So I don't see any further questions. Um, with that, uh, in terms of sequencing, we will uh, accept this as information, but definitely look forward to um, supporting you uh, a little bit more um, going forward with this particular project. Um, so I do have a mover and seconder. Uh, I heard Audrey moved and, and Michelle was seconding. Um, just confirming that, because uh, it was you know, a few minutes ago, I got thumbs up and I got Audrey. Yes. Okay. Okay, so having been properly moved and uh, seconded, I'm going to see if there's any further questions, uh, debate, um, seeing so, none. So that, cha that changes the motion as for information versus accept and approve, correct? Yep, so it'll read Six Nations of the Grand River Council. Um, where was that? So the human services recommends to the six nations of the Grand River Council to accept as information, the community health assessment update. Okay, all in favor? Any in opposed? Favor. Seeing and hearing none, motion has passed. Again, thank you, Sarah, for the presentation and we'll be in touch. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. Have a good one. Okay, Council, I'm going to move us into the next uh, agenda item. We are on 4C, uh, Haudenosaunee Health Services. I do see Colleen has uh, joined us. Maybe um, Audrey, do we wave second motion, second reading? This is general. Accept as information? I don't think so. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Um, going into 4C, uh, Haudenosaunee Health Services. Uh, so what we're doing about 10, 15 minutes, the last one went a bit long because it was um, uh, an important presentation, uh, but we've been trying to keep it to 10, 15 minutes. That gives us to 10, 15 minutes for dialogue at the back end. Um, and uh, you should have your share screen capabilities. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you. Oh, good evening, everyone. Um, Ours will be very short. Uh, I've been in front of council on a few occasions in regards to a BCR in moving forward with obtaining uh, support for a diagnostic imaging program on the reserve. And with Haudenosaunee Health Services, we wanted a more specific BCR with our working group to move forward with Chief Mark Hill, whom we met with on April 28th um, to discuss uh, support for diagnostic imaging license with the federal government. So this is something that um, I've been at for over 10 years now, and we're in a position right now where we feel very secure um, moving forward with those discussions and dialogue with Chief Mark Hill and the federal government to uh, working in agreement. Okay, thanks. Question, comments? When? So, first of all, I absolutely support it. And I have to really commend Haudenosaunee Health Services for the work that they're doing in showcasing health professionals, especially young professionals. I mean, it's making such a significant impact on social media. People are talking about it. So I think that's fabulous work. So congratulations there. I absolutely support this. I. The piece that I don't get, I don't understand is that, so this is a separate entity, um, separate service, separate, cause you have, we have federal, right? Under health services, GANYOS. Then we have health services 
and the mixture of federal and provincial services that we have. And this is another tier is that's how, is, like if I'm looking at a picture, we have three pillars in the community or is there an umbrella or just, if you can just in one sentence, tell me what that looks like. But you know, other than that, I certainly support it. We need it. Um, what we're trying to obtain, Wendy, is it'll be classified as an independent health facility. So what it is, is similar to any type of clinic, uh, radiology clinic outside a hospital in a community. Um, so that's the structure and the framework that we're trying to maintain. So is there, in regards to the federal government, the federal government will, will issue the licensing, but we also must maintain that acceptance and that approval from the OHIP, like from Ontario, because we need that OHIP billing. So it's a combination, mm -hmm. but it will be an independent health facility, the licensing. Does that make sense? I, I, no, I understand that. Um, and, and I don't have an issue with it. I mean, I support what you're doing because we need the service here. I'm just thinking about some of this other work that's going on, and I don't know if Audrey or those that sit on um, human services, but all the work being done on a health planning process of what health and wellness services look like over the next, you know, 5, 10, 20 years in the community. That's why I asked, so this is a separate pillar because it's a private entity doing this specific work. And then you have health services, what's going on under you know the elected council and and that whole process and then you have whatever's going on federally ganios right which is a yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. their own jurisdiction so i just want to understand that in my mind okay i think there is an opportunity for for haudenosaunee health services to collaborate with six nations health obviously to align with the community health plan and their needs for the future mm -hmm. because i i do believe that ultimately the end result is for our community. So definitely room for collaboration with, mm -hmm. with Six Nations Health and Six Nations Elected Council. So when, when it's appropriate, I'm happy to move on this, Nathan. Okay. Thank you for that, Wendy. And thanks for um, clarification, Colleen. Uh, any further questions on this? I don't see any, so I'm gonna move. I have a question, uh, Nate. Oh, sorry, is that Audrey? Yes. What happened okay. to your your big idea with um, with the clinic and the, the uh, other people that you're working with from the Toronto area? Um, to be honest, to be honest, Audrey, um, I haven't had any type of correspondence over the last year, so that doesn't stop us from moving uh -huh. forward with oh, our really? work. Yeah. So we'll still continue to move forward because what we're representing is a need for service, obviously, but there's so much more from the community level because what we're trying to do is also align our, our vision with Six Nations Polytech, McMaster and Mohawk to promote more health careers in our community. So, you know, the work doesn't stop. So we, we've been working right through COVID and, and we know that this is important for our community. And you have a plan for a building and where you think you might situate yourself? Um, there's a tentative, but I can't, I like, I'm not at liberty to discuss anything like that only because there is no concrete um, investor, but we need that licensing agreement first before we can go in and start discussing any type of building and such. Like we need to have an agreement in place. I mean, we can go put a building up and put equipment in there, but it's no good if we don't have an agreement. So that's, you know, that's paramount that we work on that first. So that's why we're here. So you just, you just basically just want to get your license first and then yes. expand from there. Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll second it, Nate. Okay. Okay, uh, having been properly moved and seconded, I'm gonna do a second call for questions, comments. Uh, it's Melba. Go ahead, Melba. Yeah, I, I... I certainly agree with this Haudenosaunee Health Service Group also. They have did uh, presentations in the past, at least one that I'm aware of and maybe more. But at that time I asked uh, Lori Davis-Hill if she 
what what her ideas were in relation to what is happening here and she certainly agreed so i think that's very important that we we certainly get the agreement of people that are already um working in the medical field in the health field in our community so i certainly agree that we should be certainly uh looking into indigenous medicine here in the community we do have a lot of people of course that do that but now we're going to have it uh actually in a united plan as it says here in the community so they will be collaborating with all our people who are very knowledgeable of of our indigenous medicines and healing approaches that are necessary to uh uh move forward and uh certainly heal in many ways of our people so i certainly agree with uh what the the briefing note has mentioned the Haudenosaunee Health Services group so i agree and if it hasn't been seconded i will second it thanks for that melba but it has been properly moved and seconded so moved by wendy and seconded by audrey um but definitely your comments most valuable going forward in terms of that support um, so with that, I don't see any further hands, so I'm going to go to the vote. All in favor? Favor. Is there any opposed? Hearing and seeing none, motion has passed. Uh, I will be waiving second reading on this one. Um, so motion to waive second reading. Nathan, I'll, I'll move. Is there anyone that needs to declare a conflict in the process? Just double checking. Double check conflict. None being declared. Okay, uh, moving okay. to um, Audrey, are you good for us? Um, I am, we'll Nate. Oh. One second. Uh, okay, haven't been properly moved and seconded. No declares of conflicts. So I'll move to the vote. All in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion has passed. Uh, Colleen, thank you for your time um, and uh, look forward to that further collaboration we spoke about too. Excellent. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Council, I'm going to move us into our um, agenda item. Uh, we moved it from in camera to open. Um, I believe, Matt, you're going to be introducing this and I believe you brought some friends with you. Yes, I did. Uh, thank you, Nathan. And uh, thank you, Council. Um, <clears throat> I'm here uh, accompanied with uh, by David Zeckfeld and Kelly Greaves of Atura. And uh, I had previously submitted a package to the Council, accompanied by a briefing note from me, uh, <clears throat> and, and then which accompanied a letter from David to, to Chief Hill. And so I'll just speak briefly about the briefing note. And, and then what I'll do is I'll turn it over to David, who will touch on the letter and walk through a PowerPoint to explain what the opportunity is that we're exploring. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> from my memo, uh, I made a note that this does, it's, it is intended to accompany his, David's letter, which he'll speak to in a minute. But really, Atura is a, is a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, OPG. And for council, I'm sure council is aware that Six Nations is a partner with OPG in the in the development and operation of the 44 megawatt solar farm down in the Nanticoke area, which was commissioned a couple of years back. Uh, the hydrogen opportunity that we're talking about this evening is really targeted at helping Canada meet its 2015 net zero goals uh, <clears throat> through greenhouse gas reductions. Uh, clearly that's a goal I think that aligns with the values of our communities and it's, uh, something that I think is uh, a sustainable focus that is meaningful. Uh, in December of 2021, so just a, a six months ago or so, Natural Resource Canada uh, reaffirmed its support for the net zero goal by launching a $1.5 billion clean fuel funds initiative. And within that initiative, they set aside $250 million specifically for projects with 50% Indigenous participation. Now, the process is, um, it's a phased approach, with the first phase being to conduct, to conduct a feasibility study to see if a project is even viable or makes sense. And if we get through that gate, then it would go to the next stage, phase two, which is more of the engineering and design phase. Uh, but not to get ahead of ourselves, uh, what we're talking about is proceeding to 
uh, complete a feasibility study. On April the 7th, so it's about a month ago, the province of Ontario announced its support for Atura's proposal for a similar hydrogen plant in the Niagara Falls area. It's a 20 megawatt electrolyzer uh, that's, that's focused on providing grid balancing services. Uh, and so that would be the first iteration of a hydrogen plant here in this region. And it will provide a lot of key learning, I think, that could help inform a second opportunity. When Ontario announced their support, they, cite, they cited some things that I think are somewhat aligned with our interests, which are greenhouse gas reductions, as they talked about, uh, job creation, and the promotion of energy diversity and reliability. You know, as we move forward uh, in the province, in the region, we all need energy reliability and having a good source of uh, good, sustainable, clean energy, I think is a smart thing. So for us, what we're talking about is an opportunity for Six Nations to participate alongside OPG in a, I'm sorry, Atura, uh, in a development down in the, in the Nanny Coke region on a site they call the Nanny Coke Hydrogen Center. Uh, <clears throat> and it's really targeted at a 44 megawatt uh, electrolyzer uh, system down there, uh, which David will talk about in the presentation. Some of the benefits for us as a community are to build capacity around this new technology, to learn about how it works, to provide education and training for our, for our community members and employment, hopefully to operate this thing in the future. And then we would, uh, if this thing moves ahead, participate in the project development and the construction, so there would be job opportunities there. We would become an owner and we would realize profit as a result of that. And we would be responsible for potentially reducing up to 34,000 tons of greenhouse gas emissions every year which I think is meaningful. Uh, <clears throat> so the site, as I mentioned, is down in the Nanny Cook area and David's presentation will speak to that. And uh, our next steps um, are to make an application to the clean fuel funds for the, for the phase one feasibility study. And if that's approved, they will fund 75% of the cost, which are about $900,000 and Atura will fund the unfunded portion. So we're not gonna be out of pocket uh, for the phase one feasibility study. If we're not approved, uh, for the feasibility study, we, 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 are, we are intending to dissolve any arrangements and put the project behind us and look for other opportunities. But if we are funded, we will uh, arrive uh, with, an, with an outcome based on the feasibility study to tell us whether or not the project is viable. And at that point, we may decide if it makes sense to proceed into phase two, which is the engineering and design phase. But that would be getting ahead of ourselves. I think the first order of business is let's put an application in, get these funding dollars, complete the feasibility study so we know what the opportunity looks like and what the impacts might be. So with that, I want to turn it over to David. And do we have uh, control where we can run our own PowerPoint? Or uh, will somebody do that for us, Nathan? No, you can share your screen. I see David has done so now. And David, oh. has David you're way ahead of me. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks very much, Matt. And thank you, Councillor, for the opportunity to present this evening. Uh, as I noted in my letter to Chief Hill, we see a great opportunity to produce low carbon hydrogen at the Nanticoke site. And that low carbon hydrogen can be used to decarbonize heavy emitting industries and in transportation. Uh, we know OPG has started a, a good relationship uh, with the Nanticoke Solar Facility. So we're proposing to, to further that relationship with Atura Power, the subsidiary of OPG, uh, by working on this feasibility for this hydrogen facility. <clears throat> And it is very early stages, as Matt said. So we will, you know, we're, we're happy to be engaging at this point where we're looking at feasibility and scoping, uh, which would then lead to uh, design engineering and then finally the, the construction of the facility. So Nathan, if you're, you're good with it, shall I jump into the presentation or uh, did you wanna ask for any questions before we get started? Uh, is there any um, questions as it relates to the introduction or context that was provided, or can we move into the presentation? I'm just going to do a quick check. I don't see any hands going up, um, David, so I would suggest you proceed. And, and just so you know, um, just to be fair with my other um, presenters, um, we've been given about 10, 15 minutes for presentation. That also gives us time at the end for uh, dialogue. Great. We can definitely manage 10 to 15 minutes. Thanks, okay. David. Sorry, uh, David, I did just had a hand coming okay. up, so I'm just gonna go to Councillor Wendy. Sure. I, I do have a question on the briefing note and the next steps and the recommendation, but I think it's important for the community to hear the presentation to understand what it is, so. Okay, okay, thanks. Great. So 
quick overview for the, the presentation that I'll give. What is hydrogen or low carbon hydrogen? Why is Canada particularly interested in low carbon hydrogen? Uh, the proposed Nanticoke hydrogen project, uh, the funding that we're looking at pursuing and the potential partnership outline. So starting off with what is hydrogen and why are we interested in it? And at the very highest level, hydrogen is an energy carrier and it can store energy. So we intend to produce hydrogen using electrolysis. So we put energy in from uh, a low carbon uh, source of electricity like solar, like hydro, uh, which can be used to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. You capture the hydrogen, the oxygen can go to the atmosphere, and that hydrogen can then be recombined with the oxygen to produce energy. And that recombination can happen in a fuel cell or by combustion. And when that recombination happens, energy is released. So hydrogen is a very versatile energy carrier. It can be used to uh, substitute gas or diesel and decarbonize things like heavy duty trucking, aviation, shipping, uh, and in industries like steel, uh, refineries, and, and power generation. All of these uh, industries and mobility forms are very challenging to electrify given the, the size of, of what's being moved generally, particularly in heavy duty trucking and aviation. So hydrogen is largely viewed as the energy carrier of the future with what's happening in the, uh, Ukraine and Russia. There's a lot of push in Europe right now to be moving towards green hydrogen as a substitute for, um, for Russian oil and gas. Uh, so we in Ontario, we have a very low carbon electricity grid that is exceptionally well suited to making low carbon hydrogen. And so we're proposing this feasibility at Nanticoke in, in partnership with the uh, Six Nations of the Grand River Economic D uh, Development Corp to see what the opportunity is at Nanticoke to produce this low carbon hydrogen. And why we as OPG and OPG subsidiary uh, Atura Power are interested in low carbon hydrogen is we've made a net zero commitment by 2040 and we've also made a commitment to uh, net zero carbon economy by 2050. And what that means for us is doing things that support low carbon uh, initiatives in the province of Ontario. So using our clean electricity to produce clean hydrogen is a way that we can help to achieve a net zero carbon economy. And this is very much aligned with Canada's overall hydrogen strategy. So uh, in December, 2020, Canada issued uh, its hydrogen strategy and it talked about the potential that hydrogen could play in a net zero 2050 um, scenario. And the numbers that were, were stated include up to 30% of delivered energy could be provided by hydrogen, which is just a huge amount of energy. Uh, and today it's very minimal so that the amount of growth uh, that we see as an opportunity is very high. But not all hydrogen is equal. Uh, hydrogen is classified by color. It's, the hydrogen molecule is actually not any of these colors, but the colors are used to indicate the carbon intensity of the, the hydrogen that's produced. So if hydrogen were produced, and, and in some areas of the world it is produced using coal or oil, there's a significant amount of emissions from that to make hydrogen. Similarly, if you were to use natural gas to make hydrogen, there are uh, significant emissions. One way to reduce that is to make what's called blue hydrogen, where you store the CO2 underground using carbon capture utilization and storage. But what we're proposing to do is to make low carbon clean hydrogen or green hydrogen, which is made using clean electricity and water. You put electricity in the water, it separates the H2O, the H2 and the O2. Uh, again, the O2 is vented, it's just oxygen, and the H2 is captured. So this is the clean way to produce hydrogen. And th again, this is what we're proposing at Nanticoke. So the opportunity and the uses for hydrogen are quite extensive. Uh, we do see the near-term opportunity really to substitute uh, hydrogen that is happening in different industrial processes today, be it oil and gas, fertilizer, uh, and steel manufacturing. These are heavy emitters today that would benefit from clean hydrogen to reduce their overall uh, impact on the environment. 
Uh, but what we do see growing in the future is hydrogen as a transportation fuel alternative. So substitution for diesel in the future. Uh, particularly heavy duty trucks are well suited to use hydrogen. Uh, and we expect that by 2030, it'll, it'll be a large share of new uh, heavy duty trucks that are sold. Um, smaller vehicles, passenger vehicles, the, the cars we're driving every day probably will be best by electrification, in fact, by batteries. Uh, so it's really those big heavy duty vehicles that are doing long trips uh, that are best suited for, for hydrogen. And hydrogen can also be used to uh, reduce emissions from natural gas and the natural gas grid. So Enbridge in their Markham uh, facility blends hydrogen into the natural gas system, which has a net reduction in emissions from the natural gas that's used in people's homes for heating or, or cooking. So what does the, the feasibility study look like at Nantico? I mean, again, early days, but um, we envision uh, a 44 megawatt facility. So that's the size uh, of the electrolyzer. Really, how much electricity can it consume? So we're, we're thinking about 44 uh, megawatts, which is reasonably sized. There's some very large projects that have been announced recently with the interest in hydrogen. I'd say that this is modest in contrast to some of those larger uh, announcements, but we think it's the right size to, to start um, production at Nanticoke. That's about one-tenth of Nanticoke's current demand, so there's room to grow uh, as the project um, is successful. And as Matt mentioned, we're targeting the NRCAN Clean Fuel Fund Indigenous-led project stream. And this, uh, this stream has a 50% Indigenous partner ownership, uh, and we've been in conversation with, um, with Matt and his team for, for a while, as well as uh, the Mississaugas of the Credit Business Corporation to identify what opportunities there could be, um, really modeling what we've done at Nanticoke Solar, where we've, uh, we've had a successful relationship to get that solar project off the ground. In terms of the, the, the costs and the phases of the project, we are looking at a phased pro approach. We're at the beginning now. Feasibility study is first at just under a, a million dollars. Enercan would be looking to fund that to the tune of about 75%, and uh, Chura Power would be uh, funding the balance of that. Then we move into front end engineering and design, which we estimate now to be about five to 10 million. At the end of the feasibility study, we'll have a much clearer idea on what that cost actually is. And then finally, the production uh, site, which could range from 120 to 175. Um, so the, there's a range of investment given there for, for Indigenous partners. Now that is uh, fully contingent on what we find from the feed, what we find from the production, what the business case is, there, but it's meant to be indicative at this time. So we are targeting uh, to get a proposal in and, and we've been working with Matt to see uh, how we can manage this, but uh, kind of end of May timeframe. Uh, the reason why we're uh, eager to get this in as it is on a rolling basis, first come, first serve. So the first proposal in the door that uh, ticks the boxes will be the one that gets um, the, the funding awarded. Sorry, David, um, just gonna jump in here. Um, somebody had, we can hear a dog barking. Um, somebody is not on mute. So if you're not on mute, um, please put yourself. Terrible it's not there. me. Mine would be <laughs> I to, I to, a six-month-old crying in the background, but he's okay. uh, behaving now. <laughs> I think we're good. Um, so the, the project that we're proposing again, uh, 44 megawatts, the equivalent amount of hydrogen than that would be is usually measured in tons, tons per year. So we've got 200,000 tons over the life of the project, 6,500 tons per year. Uh, almost a ton per hour. Uh, and again, what the uses are in the near term, we see steel manufacturing, oil refinery, and mobility as the, the three main offtakes in the area. Uh, and the Clean Fuel Fund is what we're seeking to, to reduce the amount of capital. Firstly, that's required. And secondly, that would be at risk when we move forward with the project. Um, and again, a little more on the, the end use case. So what does this actually mean in terms of GHG? reduction and, and climate benefit. Uh, we would be seeking to displace some of that dirty hydrogen that's currently being used or displacing natural gas uh, in some of those heavy uh, 
emitting sectors. And then longer term, we would displace diesel or gasoline in the transport sector. And the, the anticipated environmental benefit of this would be about 34,000 tons of CO2 per year. And if you equate that in a number of cars, that's about 8,000 cars uh, off the road per year. And again, we, we think this is a, an ambitious but yet still modest project. Um, it's about one-tenth of the total hydrogen demand in that area, so there's room for growth. But we want to stop, start with what's a reasonable size project and one that we can uh, safely bite off. So a few considerations about the site, and I'll, I'll move to a bigger view of the Nanticoke site and some of the other projects that I know um, you're participating in. Uh, and, and so you can see where we're, we're proposing this could go. But in terms of the water consumption, you're looking at about uh, 130,000 cubic meters per year. And again, this is water likely to be taken um, from municipal water supply that's split into hydrogen and oxygen. And then when used, recombined into H2O. Uh, and it really has that full cycle effect of you take the water, you split it by putting energy in, you take energy out when you recombine it, and the, the water is, uh, is returned at wherever it's used. And so here is uh, one of the sites. The other site that was on the previous page is, is just on the right-hand side of the Nanticoke facility. And for the broader perspective, that's where these pink lines go, uh, pretty much on what was the, the uh, Nanticoke um, power facility and adjacent to the, uh, to the Nanticoke solar project, which Six Nations is participating in, not far from the Oneida energy storage facility or the Lake Erie connector, which are outlined on there as well. So Nanticoke is really turning into a, a clean energy uh, hub or, or center, if you will, given these, uh, these energy projects that are ongoing. And so the funding sources that we're seeking uh, are, are largely through uh, NRCAN. Uh, it's got the Clean Fuels Fund, which has an Indigenous-led stream. Um, and that's the, the fund that we're targeting, looking at a, less than a million for the feasibility, the front-end engineering and design, and then um, production with two decision gates. So when we get to the end of feasibility, if this doesn't work as much as we dissolve the partnership and, and move forward. Uh, and this is the, the proposed outline. This is really more for, you know, how we would set up the legal entities that would work on this project, but we would um, have a, a limited partnership in the end that would be um, submitting the proposal and working on this project, uh, on, in part by Atura, in part by um, uh, Six Nations uh, of the Grand River Economic Development Corp. And you can see here that OPG is the ultimate owner of, of Atura. And so that's all I've got for today. Uh, and it's, um, it's a project that we think has a lot of merit given its location and its proximity to the existing facility and an opportunity to build on what we've already started with uh, the Nanticoke Solar Facility. So happy to answer any questions now. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, so we did have some questions. I'm just going to get right to it. Um, I'll save my comments for the end. Um, but um, with that, I'll, I'll go to Wendy, uh, Audrey, and then Sherry. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out the timing on, on this. And I see in your presentation, it's April 2022, which it's May. You know, the briefing note that we received was May. Um, yeah, I, I think we've only had our agenda package for a day or two, so that doesn't give us a whole lot of time to review all of this information. From what you've presented, I mean, um, ActDev has had the opportunity to have quite extensive dialogue on all of this. You know, it would be wonderful if we had that same opportunity to, you know, Matt, if you could bring us some information, you know, in preliminary stages so that we had some understanding of what was going on so that we could be prepared when presentations come to the table rather than having, 
24 hours to review all of this, observe it all, understand it all, and make a decision on how to go forward. And you might say that, well, it's just approval to do a feasibility study. And if it doesn't go, it doesn't go. But there's a whole lot of information to decide, do we even want to do that? Um, and you know, one of the pet peeves that I have is having something presented and always being told, but timing's an issue. You know, we have to get this in, we have to be first to the table. If we don't do it, then we lose this opportunity. And if that's the case, then we should have seen this two months ago, you know, out of respect and courtesy so that we had that opportunity to do our due diligence. So myself as an individual counselor who, you know, under the new system that we're going to with portfolios, you know, economy and wealth. Well, you know what, this would be my, my area and, I would like to know all the information that I need to understand this process and where it's going. You know, when I look at the briefing note, the issue that I have is I read potential ownership up to 50%. You know, we're looking at procurement, is it 51% that we should be looking at? What's a breakdown? What's the opportunity for negotiating that out? And when it comes to funding, what are we expecting? What is that highest level? And how can we have access to that funding? Because you know, under this, current regime, we don't actually get to touch that money or make a decision about it. Now, I understand that there's access, there's huge money access to set aside because under you know federal budget 2022, it's a clean Canada. In prior budgets, it's clean Canada. So there's a lot of money that's being put forward to work on that and certainly indigenous partner. So coming to the table to get indigenous you know, communities to partner to get access to that funding is a big deal. So I, I get those pieces of it. But in terms of process, if you're, you know, for me anyway, if you're expecting a decision tonight for something that you want to submit in April, you know, I respectfully ask that we be given more time to look at this and examine this so that we can make a decision on it. But that's just me. I mean, my colleagues may want to jump into it. But on the next steps, I mean, even best case scenario, to acknowledge, uh, you know, applying for that feasibility study funding and stopping there. I have a problem with number three on the next steps that, you know, if it, if it goes forward, then you jump right into the front end engineering and design and, and so on and, and next steps. If anything further is going to be done past getting access to funding for feasibility using our community, then it should come back to the table for discussion after that and how that goes forward. So those are just some of my comments, thanks. Thanks, Wendy. And, and definitely good comments on, on the, the information piece. And, and two, that's um, one of the things as council we got to work out too is that environmental piece, right? Um, and um, uh, I know it's not an official organ yet, but it will become one um, soon where, where in information and presentations like this will come, but that's at our end too of improving that going forward. So next I have uh, Audrey and Sherry Lynn. Hi, uh, yeah. Hi, Matt and Ruth. <clears throat> I think it's a really good opportunity for us to take a look at, and I think we should be going ahead with a feasibility study. That feasibility study will tell us an awful lot and that'll help us make our decision whether or not we wanna go forward. But I do agree that after the feasibility study, after each stage and step, we should be bringing it back to discuss it in, in a complete context with the council so that we um, know exactly and we can make informed decisions on what the next step entails. Anybody who's got questions, let, let's, let's, let's hear them. Let's get them answered so that we can progress and move along with this. Or if it's something we find out that it's not for us, then we dissolve it, we stop, and we go our separate ways. But if it's truly going to be an, an asset to lower the, uh, to to go into the green energy, uh, that's where everybody's moving right now. So if we can stealthily move along with that, that would be a, probably a really good idea. But the feasibility study, in my opinion, will help determine that for us. Yeah. Thanks for that, Audrey. And Sherry Lynn. 
Well, I guess for myself, um, in the sense, I understand, um, I see how we fit in there because it's under an indigenous um, application. That was my first one. I guess the part that I have is hydrogen energy is, is it, is it a good price or is it expensive? Are we gonna make money off of it? Yes. <clears throat> so there is a premium associated with hydrogen. That's why it isn't used widely today. But what we see happening in, um, in the world in Canada is a carbon tax coming in place at the federal level that will increase the cost of those heavy emitters using things like diesel. Uh, there's also a, a clean fuel standard that the federal government is putting in place that will be an opportunity to generate credits for clean hydrogen under that standard that can be traded um, in, and certainly have more value than let's say uh, simply putting hydrogen on the market today. So it is an area that's going to see growth, particularly as we see the cost of carbon increasing. It brings the price of competing fuels up to where hydrogen would be. But part of the, the purpose of the feasibility is to do exactly that, flesh out the economics, look at the offtake from partners in the area, determine what would be um, you know, most economical and, and, and what the project economics are overall. Yeah, and I, and I guess that's what I'm looking at too, is because getting involved, and I understand you know, this, how well it is and stuff. I guess though, that, <clears throat> that's my thing. Is it a good price or is it gonna be expensive? Um, what would be the storage complica um, uh, complicate, like complications? Um, is, this, is this a safe source of energy? Uh, will this sustain the population, right? Because if it's, if it's gonna sustain the population, I guess my thing is, is I know um, we're going to energy, but how long would it take to make money? I guess, meaning that um, because cars would have to be, cars and service stations would have to be customized. So there's a lot of things that need to be, I, I have more answers. I have like, I have more questions, I guess, than answers because this is a whole ball of wax in the sense of, is this dependent on fossil fuel? Is it dependent on fossil fuel? No, it's not dependent on fossil fuel. It uses uh, electricity and water. Okay. So I have more questions and, um, regarding these kinds of things. And I understand, you know, the, the, the study and stuff and why they're here. Um, I just want to make sure we do our due diligence and um, have these hard conversations because the community deserves it. We need, the, we need the answers before we get involved in anything. And those are the kind of questions and answers that I wanna hear. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Sherry Lynn. I have Matt, go ahead. See your hand up. Yeah, thanks. So good questions, good comments. Um, and with respect to the materials, I, I, um, I'm a little surprised. We had the materials in the council last week, last Wednesday. So I'm surprised if you just got them yesterday. Um, we understood that they were to be in by Wednesday for the following week. So if there's a different standard that we can follow, uh, we'd be happy to follow it. Just let us know what that standard is. Um, <clears throat> but I think we've sort of danced around the issue. It's it it is the feasibility study is really the the key piece that'll be the catalyst of understanding for us to actually make an informed decision. And it will it will include the factors of consideration that would be important for us to share with the community once we know them. And and right now there's a lot of theoretical uh, thinking out there. We we think we know. We think it's a good idea, but we won't know until we really dig into the issues. And that's really what the feasibility study is all about. So we can make an informed decision. That's part of the due diligence. Uh, and I think that this is uh, it's an opportunity that I think it's worthy of exploring because there is a sustainable focus. It's greenhouse gas reductions, it's doing our part. And if we don't do our part and then who will? And I think that uh, that's part of a responsibility we have to our, to our community and to our future generations. So uh, that's really my comments, Nathan, thanks. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Sherry Lynn? Uh, Wendy and then Hazel. Oh, sorry. That was just a... <laughs> Legacy hand? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Wendy and then Hazel. Yeah, so, so for me, I mean, 
I would love to be able to sit here and with great confidence and with education on the matter to be able to support it going forward. And, and whether it was last Wednesday or yesterday, that's still a not, not a lot of time because I'm sure Matt, you've had a lot more time. You know, if it was a month ago and we were given a heads up and a briefing note and a report that this is coming down, this is what the topic is, allow us to do homework so that, you know, I can research, I can do what I need to. Do we need to loop in the environment committee? Do we need to loop in natural gas? Who else do we need to loop in on this topic so that we can do this in an informed way, in an educated way? That's what I'm looking for. So regardless if it was Wednesday or yesterday, it's not a lot of time. And I dislike being put on the spot with external parties and pre presenters coming to the table and being cornered with, we need to make a decision on this right now, because that's unfair. Certainly that's how I feel. You know, maybe this is a fantastic opportunity, but I don't know because I don't know the topic well enough and fluently enough to be able to make that decision. And even in feasibility, because we're putting resources into play, you know, and putting our name out there in the application, is this something that we want to do? Is this something that we want to support? No. So, and already it's make the decision today because I see April, 2022. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, you know, I'm just, I'd love the opportunity to hear from the environmental committee and to see some more information. Sherry Lynn asked a lot of good questions. Um, anyhow. Thanks for that, Wendy. I'll go to Hazel and then we'll start wrapping up and getting into the next steps here. Yes, I would just like to make the comment about um, this topic because I think in order to like what Matt has already said about getting the answers he needs to do the feasibility study to give us the answers so either way whether it's time and it's costly costly to do it um, that gives you a better picture of the whole entire situation and um, I personally I would like to see the feasibility study done on this in order to make a good informed decision. And the only way to, to get that is to uh, give the go ahead to do that. So that's my position on this. Thank you. Thanks, Hazel. Um, so we have uh, very diverse um, opinions on this um, going forward as it relates to how we're going to move forward. And I do apologize for our guests um, because yeah, we did not get the information um, and, and we did have a day. That's that's the reality that we're all faced with here. Um, and there is some comfort level with some counselors and uncomfort level with other counselors. I think that's obvious of where we're at. I'm trying to walk us through this in a good way. Um, so, oh, sorry, I did see one more hand up. Uh, Wendy? So in that application for funding, whether or not the feasibility study is approved or not. Does it have to be spelled out what the relationship is between us and Atura? So is it that 50%? So is that laid out in that process? And are we stuck to whatever that is in the application? David, do you want to comment on that? Sure. Uh, the Contribution requires 50% uh, Indigenous participation. And so uh, the up to would be a combination of, of Six Nations, um, ECDEV Corp, and Mississaugas uh, of the Credit Business Corporation. Um, uh, amount to be determined. So we're sharing that 50%. That's not all Six Nations. What is that breakdown of that? because we're entering into a partnership with Mississaugas without even knowing in this application. So what's binding on that if we get the funding to do the feasibility study? Because the government just doesn't hand out money and then nothing in return, right? And you know, if we can opt out. So what are those clauses in that 
application once we do that? And what is that split between us and Mississaugas of the credit to make up that 50%? I thought we were the 50. I think, I think just to clarify, um, you know, as David mentioned in the PowerPoint, there's a decision point after the feasibility study. We're not bound to do anything other than get the feasibility study done so we have our eyes wide open and then we can make decisions. Maybe the Mississaugas don't want to participate. Maybe we don't want to. Uh, but, but in any event, we want to get the feasibility study done so we understand what the opportunities are, what the risks are. And it may not fit either of us, in which case we will dismantle the, the agreements we have with Atura and move on. So, 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 but my question was, in that 50% Indigenous, what is the split between us and Mississaugas of the credit? And I assume they would have to be on the application as well. So they should actually be part of this discussion, I would think. I think the portion of ownership stated in the memo is up to 50% because we don't have a commitment from the Mississaugas on whether or not they're gonna participate in the process. So, so we, we can approve this motion to go forward without having any confirmation. So if, Mrs. if we approve it, Mississaugas come back and say they want 40% of that up to 50, does that leave us with 10? No, we've had some, some discussion around modeling this after the ownership structure of the Nanny Coke Solar Project, which does sort of set out the ownership structure that we would like to pursue, but doesn't necessarily mean that would have to actually happen because we don't wanna make any concrete decisions until we have the feasibility study in hand and we know what the project risks and factors might, might be. And, and just to be clear, the, 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 the recommendation is that the council acknowledge that the development corporation will participate with Atura in submitting the application. We're not, we're not asking the council to give us permission to submit the application. So, but if you're using Six Nations of the Grand River on that application, because we are the single sole shareholder to the ECDEP Corporation, you are binding us in that process, in that application. For me, it's a big unknown, not knowing what the confirmation is between two First Nations community and where one of them. So I'm not gonna argue it, belabor it anymore, but I think that's a big missing element. Good point. Um, good discussion. <laughs> I don't know where we're going to land on Melba? this. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to go Audrey and then Melba and then we're going to go into next steps. Melba can go next and I'll go after her. Go ahead, Melba. Oh, okay. I'm like Wendy. I don't know the topic good enough. Um, I believe that we should uh, certainly uh, have confidence if possible in our people who are presenting, such as Matt. I think we move, need to move forward with education, awareness, understanding, benefits, a legal review. It's all in here that we're asking for, for um, understanding of the results, which will happen if we have a feasibility study. Further results we will have and if it is viable and legal review. So it's all gonna come forward with further understanding. So I, I fail to understand how we can actually turn this away based on some of the areas that will be of benefit such as employment and training. Uh, we're talking about, I like when you said green energy instead of Russia's oil and gas, we're, we're, we're hearing about this every day. The sanctions that are put on as a result of all the atrocities that are, are being, being done to people. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable that uh, we're in a situation like this and that we would turn this down to not look at a feasibility study that can benefit us in years and years to come and, and benefit uh, Canada, as was said. We hear about this all the time. I hear of uh, 
our prime minister and what his goal is is 2050. We all hear of that. So I hopefully that we will uh, certainly approve this tonight so we can move forward for our community and the rest of Canada and whoever else will benefit in the future. Thank you. Ms. Melba, Audrey. Yeah, are you ready for a motion? Because I'd like to make a motion. Don't see any hands going up, so um, yeah, for sure. Okay, I'd like to make a motion that we move on this and, and uh, conduct the feasibility study as requested. I so move. And I'll second the motion, Melba. Yeah, just to confirm, you're moving the motion as worded in the recommendation? Well, let me look at it again. Yes, just as, as, as done. There are any changes. Matt, there are any changes to this, are there? No. Okay, this uh, motion as is, please. And uh, Melba, you're good with that? Yes, I'm good. Uh, what I understand is just secure the feasibility funding to assess the viability of, of a 44 megawatt hydrogen facility. Okay, having been properly moved and seconded, I'm going to go back to council to see if there's any further comments, questions on the motion. Having heard and seeing none, I'm going to go to the vote. Uh, all in favor? Favor. Okay. Favor. 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 Is there any opposed? Nathan, can I have a recorded vote opposition based on the fact that in the application there is no concrete information on what this percentage ownership Six Nations has within this process with another First Nation? Thank you for that, Wendy. That has been noted. Um, I have one opposed. Is there any further? I'm opposed. opposed. I'm opposed, Sherlyn. Okay, so I have one, two, three, four in favor, two opposed. Um, noted the opposition. Um, this motion has passed. Moving to second reading. I'll wave, Nathan. What? I'll motion, to wave. motion to wave second reading, moved and seconded. All in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Same note for me, Nathan, thanks. Thanks, Wendy, same, got that Same, noted. Nathan, for me too. Noted. Okay, noted opposition uh, from Wendy and Sherry Lynn. And that motion has passed as well, four to two. Great, thank you, okay. Council. Definitely, but I did want to underscore because um, I too did not have information and I um, definitely know some of the actors have to kind of work on that. You know, it's, it's not council uh, and I'm not putting everything on Dev Corp, but uh, as a group, as a team, I think uh, information flow coming to council could, could improve. Um, I'm always looking at constant improvement um, because uh, as others, uh, I spent most of the afternoon figuring out what hydrogen is. Um, so, yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, we're more than happy to work with council. Happy to sit down and have that conversation. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, if there's no further questions, I'd like to thank Matt, uh, definitely David, and, and Kelly for your attention uh, this or sorry this evening, and thanks for the presentation. And look forward to our next collaboration. Thank Thanks you. very much, Nathan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
Okay, Council, that concludes the delegation portion of our agenda. I'm going to move us into agenda item number five, adoption of the General Council Minutes of April 26th. I did see them in the package. Just remind council that we need a mover and seconder. I'll move on a minute, Mr. Melba. Move I'll by second Melba. Second by care. Any discussion, clarifications, questions? Okay, moved by Melba, second by Carrie. Uh, minutes of um, April 22nd, moving to the vote. All in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing and hearing on motion has passed. Uh, agenda item number six, recommendations from human services. Um, looking to Hazel, if you could read out the motion. I move that the Six Nations Health Services Committee recommends to the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council acknowledge and approve the attached draft service agreement for the Ontario Autism Program. There was a lot of documents attached to this, but they're not here. I don't, I don't know if they were in the package or not. Oh, I have them in mind, Hazel, and I reviewed them. So okay. there is a briefing note as well as the agreement um, that's attached to the briefing note. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, Melba, you're still good to second that? Yes, thank you, yep. Okay, um, looking to council, is there a clarification, questions, comments on this particular topic? Hearing and seeing none, I'm gonna move us into the vote. All in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing and hearing none, motion has passed. Uh, looking to waive second reading. I move to waive second reading. Moved by Hazel. Second by, Hazel. Second by Melba. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing and hearing none, motion has passed. Uh, seven has been deferred, so we'll move into eight scheduling. I see we don't have anything here, but uh, Tammy, did you have a quick update here? I'm sorry, Nathan, um, my computer is frozen at the moment. So by the time we get perhaps at the end of the in-camera portion of the agenda, I can hopefully provide an update. Okay. Okay, um, I'm gonna provide just a quick update on the community safety. As um, community knows, we had a long, lengthy discussion at last general council meeting as it relates to the violence that's happening in the community. Uh, some of the next steps uh, chief was gonna work on uh, as a priority to get that task force up and running um, and, and uh, to start dealing with the anti-bullying uh, task force and, and kind of uh, bringing all of our organs together within, within the community. So uh, community might uh, over the last week have saw that call out go out for representation and community representation on that uh, particular committee. And that's where it stands. Uh, I know we're doing some of the the um, the, the work to collect the information now uh, and getting that preparation ready. So um, that's the update I've been given um, going forward on that. And uh, it, it is going to be a standing item on our agenda going forward. So I just wanted to provide that quick update so community is aware. And if you do have interest in um, um, part, uh, participating in the task force on violence and anti-bullying. Um, just uh, uh, we did we did send out some social media, uh, but um, I believe Jennifer uh, Mount Pleasant is the the lead contact on that uh, to get a hold of her. I don't know if council had anything further to add on that. Uh, seeing none, um, I will go and look to motion to adjourn. I'll move, Hazel. By Hazel, seconder. Oh, second, Sherry Lynn. Second by Sherry Lynn. All in favor? 
Any polls, seeing none, would like to thank the community for their attention uh, this evening. Um, had some good dialogue and uh, wish everybody the best health and safety rest of their evening. You know, go.